Welcome back to Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. So maybe you've heard this term data mesh architecture. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you should have. Let's go talk to the architects about that and find out what this all means. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. Thank you, Eric and Uli, for joining me. What I'd like to do is sort of go in the direction that we started in our last episode when we were talking about data. Um, and we started to get into sort of ideas around implementation for, for making data meaningful and being able to work with it. And one of the implementations that I have heard about but don't know a heck of a lot about that I'm hoping we can talk about is data meshes. Right. And um, can either or one, I mean, I know what the word mesh means and I know what architecture means, but can somebody describe to me what data mesh architecture when put in those three in that order means? And, and we can dig into it a little bit. Yeah. Why don't I give it a shot first and, uh, you know, see, see where we go from there. So a, a data mesh architecture is actually encompasses two um, components, two concepts in my perspective. It encompasses the fact that there are silos of data, which are usually deep in a specific domain that you want to actually democratize and expose to other, you know, uh, engines or stores or what have you. And then there's the implementation of those uh, silos slash, you know, nodes, if you will, of data domain um, representation, which is exposing it through an API surface or an architecturally um, very similar to a microservice architecture. So the concept is that in this mesh network of data nodes, each data node has a specific domain responsibility. What happens underneath that re domain responsibility is not the business of consuming service. It's the pure responsibility of that domain's node. So that means that underneath that, there's got to be an API surface in which you push and pull data you know, to conduct transactions. There's got to be a data uh, query um, methodology in which mm -hmm. the query engine optimizes and understands where the data is stored and goes after the data. There has to be a data storage component as well. And then there has to be a way for ingestion or ingress of data into that particular node. Uh, now, we usually refer to these things as nodes because the best way to think about them is microservices. But the idea is that there's a data microservice or node for each large domain. And in large organizations, the goal would be for you to make API to API calls to actually answer questions. Uh, whether you're an insight application or you're a transactional application or a website, you're talking to domains of specificity around uh, data platforms. Now, now before you go, David. No, oh, that was I'm, a very. I'm waiting. I'm waiting, Uli, because I. That I, was I a very, very, very positive view of. Oh my God, this is how this works. Awesome. Data mesh architecture is something not necessarily new, but it's certainly becoming into focus because of the failure of data lakes. Um, it's just a realization that trying to centralize all data and put it all into one place, into one methodology, one approach, just doesn't work in most organizations. Not in all, but in most organizations, it's just too complicated because of domain ownership, uh, technology choices people have made, uh, and they don't want to give up because some CTO or whatever said, we're going to do X. Uh, that means everybody has to snap to X now uh, and they have now valuable knowledge and uh, tools and whatever set up. A lot of people effectively don't do that. And that's why data mesh architecture, in addition to what Eric so nicely described as if that's the logical way of thinking about it. In reality, it's simply we're accepting that there are different places where data is being handled and analytics being run. And the only thing that we really care about is twofold. One. We want to know what data is available where. So part of the data mesh architecture that Eric didn't mention is that there is a very strong centralized governance model that's coming into play. And the governance model simply is for two reasons. One is visibility. A lot of times the problem with these distributed architectures, which a mesh is ultimately, is that nobody knows what data is available where, who has access to the data, um, are we at risk from a compliance perspective? All sorts of questions that uh, people now wrestle with because compliance on data is very important. So a governance system is often um, a key part of a data mesh architecture. And then it's the realization that, okay, this one customer has picked cloud A, the other uh, team has picked cloud B, and technology choices built up and stuff like that. So let's not go and disrupt all of this and figure out a way how to get value out of the investments people have made 
in a way that brings uh, the data together and allows people that says, well, I can go and get to place B, get the data and then put it into my system. Uh, but I don't have to completely um, yeah, abandon all the investments I've made uh, with some better tools. Some people do that uh, and there is good reasons for that too. But a lot of times I'm seeing data mesh architecture as a realization of, yep, the world is complex. Okay, so I have so many questions. Let me start with the first question. My first question, don't panic, it'll be okay. <laughs> my, first, my first question uh, is immediately in response to what you said about we've learned our lesson. Um, why are you talking about governance and not discovery? Like governments to me, governance to me often implies or thinks about that there's something that tries to know it all and tries to control it and tries to not just find it, but also control it and, and is uh, laid upon from above versus discovery, which I would think of like what we've started to learn with like service discovery, right? Where it's up to the thing that shows up in the, in the, in the mesh to say, I'm X and this is, you know, or tell me what I should be doing or any, any of those sort of discovery models. So why is it a governance model, not a discovery model? Go ahead, Eric. Can I just interject real quickly, Uli? Because um, I think that, because this is a, a conversation I had with another one of my colleagues, I think governance used to be very much control, uh, audit, access, um, RBAC, all those types of things. I think it still is. But there's also an element of discovery associated that I think has been subsumed into the concept of governance all up. And I think it's okay. especially relevant associated with a data mesh architecture, because largely, if you're consuming these microservices, uh, associated with data nodes, it's unseen, right? It's just basically API calls. And without a strong governance layer to maintain regulatory compliance and making sure that you don't have data mesh nodes that are sisters, cousins, or brothers of each other, um, you actually have to have a catalog. And in that catalog, you actually have to expose it in the way in which you can and should have access to these services. Again, David, I think what's happening is that you have, first of all, data often doesn't announce itself. Like unlike services, they are very, little self-description services or discovery okay. uh, happens as a more of a search-like activity. So I understand where my sources are and I'm, I'm going to go after the metadata to describe the data. Um, and while there will be uh, places where data will be self-describing and stuff like that and can announce itself, uh, there's oftentimes that data is much more passive. A database you have to query in order to figure out what's going on. Um, so I think that's one reason why discovery works uh, together with governance. But the other piece that is simply a, uh, and maybe it's a convenient fact, that the discovery system dr leads to a catalog. The catalog is then used to drive governance. I know. Um, and again, the idea is to know who has access to what. Since data is becoming such a, a piece of differentiation on the one side, but also legal concern. Um, because if you have a lot of people collecting data about people, uh, California's law, the European GDPR, Schrems II, all of those acts are becoming really important and having a grip on where your data is, what the data means and who has access to it is a key piece. And if you have a data mesh model, it also is a key piece to know what data do I even have? Then a lot of times organizations really don't know what data they are, have and what it means and who has access to it. And so data mesh architectures, uh, the mesh part is bringing it all together in a virtual kind of way. So you don't copy everything around uh, into centralized places, but you still have to know what do I have? Where is it located? What system is it even in? Because while Eric's nice description of an API, blah, blah, the reality is there's almost no APIs in data. Um, people don't do APIs, you do a SQL query or you go after an HDFS folder or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> and you just have to live with different models of access uh, that are far less clean than in application uh, world, again, where events and APIs and those kind of things are very common. Um, in data, often they are not and they don't work. Um, APIs, for example, with data, it's like um, trying to run an AI algorithm through a straw because all of a sudden you're starting to see, oh, I need a petabyte of data before my AI algorithm is actually useful. You can't through a, suck that through an API. You have to effectively go and ship the AI algorithm to the 
node in the mesh and run it on top of whatever that infrastructure is. Or you have to copy the data, um, and that takes a while too. So <clears throat> there's a bunch of things where data is a bit different than APIs or code. Um, while conceptually what Eric says makes total sense, reality is far less clean. Um, and you just have to deal with, oh, this is an Oracle database, so pick up your Oracle access method and figure it out. Or oh, this one is a data lake, HDFS, great. Or oh, this is an S3 bucket, okay, go do that. Yeah, I, 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 I tend to agree with that. I think that the data mesh architecture uh, concept is nascent. Um, it's an interesting paradigm that's not going to be appropriate for all use cases. Like you said, you can't actually go and say, give me all time series telemetry for the past three years for robots of this particular type through an API. It'll never, it'll never scale. So at some point, you actually have to look at the use case and drop back down into platform level integration. I need the connection string, I need the query, I need to write in the appropriate language of that platform, and then I need to go retrieve the data in a scalable way. That, those things are typically challenging for their own reasons, and the more you have to do that, the more challenging it is. And so there's gonna be this confluence of, well, if I stick an API layer in front of this, am I going to benefit? Am I just looking for a few transactions? Am I looking for small batch data? Am I looking for near real time? Or do I actually now have to dip back down into the more traditional route of data integration, which is, Platforms got to talk to platforms. Right. I have to speak the language. I have to know the storage paradigm and all of that stuff. So I do believe that it's nascent. It's aspirational at this point, but architects should begin thinking about it. Okay. Well, I wanted to ask specifically the aspirational question. Um, and by the way, thank you for your answer about, about discovery, because, you know, as soon as you said words like regulate regulatory, I was like, Oh yeah, right. Um, uh, that seems important. Um, why the word, the aspirational question comes around the term mesh. I'm assuming we're not talking about like a full mesh, right? Like, cause that's another place where meshes get used. We have this notion that everything talks to everything else, um, which is not what I think we're arguing here or so even suggesting that that's the case. Um, but in, in a mesh situation, there's, you know, that seems to also imply a pretty flat mesh, like a pretty flat situation where, uh, you know, if I think of meshes, I mean, maybe you have meshes on top of meshes, but I often think of those as a fairly flat thing. Like, you know, like it's a bunch of, you know, it's basically the net that gets created, that gets woven by the connections between the things, right, is your mesh. Um, so I'm just trying to understand, though, it seems to me that data doesn't always play this way and that, that it's not nearly as flat as we're hoping from. Is that also aspirational? Yeah, I, I think ultimately what will end up happening is um, in those in those scenarios where it is appropriate to conduct API access to retrieve data from a node in a mesh, we're actually going to have services that talk to services that talk to services. And you're, it's actually, like you said, it's going to be kind of like this. And we do need some governance around that. We do need to know what these microservices are talking to. The good news is we know how to do that through applications like service meshes, which look after modern day microservice architectures. But I also believe that in the future, there's going to be these, the same complexity that we see in a typical microservice implementation, we're going to see in a data mesh architecture. Some of our listeners or viewers might be saying, well, is there really a difference? Isn't it all just microservices? And to that, I would say, yes. And there's gotta be data interchange elements associated with it. There's gotta be access, regulatory compliance, ETL, how the data gets there. You'll have data-centric microservices, and then you'll have transaction-centric microservices or business logic microservices as well. Because I'm assuming that the concepts around data gravity and other stuff like that haven't just gone, poof, like the fact you might have to go over there to process it. You know, you can't, it's not, it's not everywhere. It's, um, well, do you have anything to say, sort of a, a, a take us out of this question in terms of what people should be thinking about when it comes to data meshes that like beyond like this is this is the result of what we've learned, but what what do we still have to learn and what should people be paying attention to that that is gonna be uh, important in the data mesh, the, the bright new world of data meshes? You know, with my well, so We already talked already about discovery and um, governance. I think that's a really key part for me at least. Uh, the second part is thinking through how you do access um, in terms of your point, David. You, data virtualization is another term that's often associated with data mesh. And while that is a fine conceptual term, light speed and uh, network throughput doesn't matter, especially with data. Um, and you really want to make sure that you either do data shipping, meaning you copy data to the point of consumption, right. or you do function shipping where you effectively go and 
uh, ship the function uh, to uh, where the data is. And those are the two approaches to really deal with data uh, across a worldwide distribution or whatever the scope is. And that's something to not forget. And the that's why I'm saying the access pattern is really important. Um, and then thinking through who has access, what what is the access look like? What am I allowed to do? Again, for the non-European viewers, uh, Schrems 2, for example, tells you that if you were the one that collect, collected the data from a, uh, from a uh, customer, for example, and you give it to somebody else for processing, you are responsible that the original consent is mm. still being obeyed by that third party that now is processing the data. And those kind of things are becoming really important when you start to do a data mesh and you start to say it's not much, not just my internal enterprise, but I'm also bringing my supply chain or partners in um, and stuff like that. So those are the things that uh, drive my conversations often when I talk about data mesh architectures. Okay, cool. Well, it, we're, we're once again heading in another really good direction because we're sort of talking about uh, how the data moves, how the data comes into existence, how it moves around and how we care about it. Um, and I think we're going to be talking a little bit about sort of like how data and apps work, right? Which, and, and is that is that having an impact on precisely these questions? Um, so let's cut it here. Wave goodbye to the nice folks. Thank you both Eric and Uli. And uh, thank you all, <laughs> I mean, I didn't mean literally. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Armchair Architects as part of the Azure Enablement Show. I hope you'll join us again in our next episode. Mm -hmm.